Thanks very much, everybody, for coming to our first uh, Students Talk Back lunch of the fall semester. For those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Dan Schnur, and I'm the director of the Jessa Unruh Institute of Politics here at USC. And we co-sponsor these lunches every other Wednesday throughout the semester, uh, along with our friends at the Daily Trojan, and also with the USC College Democrats and College Republicans. And so normally, for those of you who've attended these programs in the past, you know, normally we ask a representative of the College Democrats and College Republicans to join us for the conversation. But today's discussion, not so much about campaign politics, but in a lot of ways a much more important discussion about how a community and its law enforcement representatives work together um, in order to keep a community safe and civil. That's a conversation that doesn't normally break down along party lines. And so we thought today that while we, always, as always, appreciate the support and the participation of the College Democrats and College Republicans, we're going to come at this one a little bit differently today. And as all of you know, there's been no shortage of conversation, not just here in Los Angeles, but nationally in recent weeks about this issue. And it's a critically important one, and it's a sensitive one. And over the years of Students Talk Back dis uh, discussion panels, We've had plenty of conversations about sensitive topics. We've talked about same-sex marriage. We've talked about immigration. We've talked about a lot of different issues that can really uh, 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 lead to very strong feelings and strong emotions on both sides of the issue. And so what I'd ask at the beginning of today's conversation, because it is a critically important one, it is, but it is one on which a lot of us have very strong feelings, is I'd ask you that when we ask you to join and participate in the conversation with our panelists, that is, we like to say, you address your question comments to them with the same respect and regard that they'd hope they'd show you if you happen to disagree with them. These conversations as we have them aren't meant to be debates, they're meant to be discussions. And particularly um, on such challenging, important, and sometimes sensitive matters, we'd ask that all of you join us in, uh, in participating with those sentiments in mind. Okay. So lecture over, let's begin, the, uh, let's begin the conversation. We're really, really lucky for today's discussion to have just a, a really phenomenal panel. Sitting, sitting immediately to my right is Commander William Scott of the LAPD. Uh, Commander Scott was appointed to the Los Angeles Police Department in 1989. As you can see, he was appointed at the age of 12. <laughs> um, he was promoted to the rank of Commander in 2012, and he's currently located in the South Bureau Office. Please join me in welcoming Commander William Scott. I'm going to skip over uh, Yasmin for just a second. Um, our second uh, off-campus guest today is Jasmine Kanick. And Ms. Kanick is one of California's most respected political communications and government affairs consultants with a specialty in crisis communications. She's worked on over 20 local, state, and federal campaigns. And I believe she's undefeated. Is that correct, Jasmine? Almost undefeated. OK. <laughs> um, but she's, run so she's won several awards for her work on the intersection of race, class, and politics. She's been featured in the LA Times, the Chicago Sun-Times, and the LA Daily News. So like Commander Scott, a real expert on the issues we're going to be talking about today, please join us in welcoming Jasmine Kanick. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have not one but two panelists representing the Daily Trojan. Um, sitting in between Commander Scott and Ms. Kanick is Yasmin Sirhan. For those of you who've attended our panels in the past, you know she's been with us several times before, usually as a moderator rather than a panelist. But Yasmin is the special projects editor at the Daily Trojan. She's a jun junior studying international relations. Yasmin, thanks so much for being here. You can clap for her too. <laughs> and finally, Nathaniel Haas, uh, who is one of the Daily Trojan's featured weekly columnists. He's a junior studying political science and economics, and he's participated in our programs quite a bit in the past also. Nathaniel, thanks so much for being here. And then I'm joined today uh, by the editor-in-chief of the Daily Trojan. And normally over the years, as we've had these programs co-sponsored with the DT, um, any number of representatives of the editorial board join us, either as panelists or as moderators. Not that often we get the editor-in-chief, so we're especially flattered and especially honored to have the editor-in-chief of the DT, you know Lee. You know, really glad you're here. So we're going to go to question to the panel with the panelists in just a second. But I'm going to start the conversation with just a little bit of framing. 
Uh, many of you may have seen on the, your chairs, we left an article that was recently published in the New York Times. Um, and it talked about how both the Los Angeles Police Department and community leaders have worked over the years to try to facilitate the kind of honest and direct and collegial conversation that can keep uh, a problem from uh, uh, becoming a, a much more difficult and violent challenge to a community. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. I had the, uh, just by happenstance, um, the night of the Rodney King riots, was riding in downtown Los Angeles with California Highway Patrol and state police officers with a very first-hand view of the violence. And what struck me in reading this article is how much time and effort and work has been put in by community leaders such as Ms. Kanick and by Los Angeles police law enforcement representatives like Commander Scott to make sure that when there are tensions, when there are episodes, that there is a way to have a conversation that keeps them from raging out of control. So it's been a, uh, it's been a, it's been a long path over the last 20 years and there's still quite a bit of uh, traveling left to be done on that path. But we thought it was important before we began the conversation about today's challenges, to offer just a little bit of historical perspective about the work that's been done over the years. So with that, we're gonna go to questioning. You know, why don't you kick us off? Thank you. Uh, so, Commander Scott, just the first question. Um, so what steps has the LAPD taken since the LA riots um, and the Rodney King incident to, alle to alleviate distress um, after an event um, such as that? And you know, what steps have been taken and what steps do you see the LAPD taking in the future? Thank you. I'm gonna, this is gonna be kind of a long-winded answer, but you guys bear with me because I, I think it's important to give you some historical perspective and I'll give you a thumbnail sketch of kind of where we've been as an organization, LAPD and law enforcement in general, and get to the, the meat of your question. Um, law enforcement, let's go back uh, to prohibition era, 30s, 40s. Law enforcement and this, this model that we now call community policing um, was actually being done, done back in those days. It, it, you had beat officers that knew their communities, communities knew officers, it was, uh, it, was, it was kind of the model of the day, although they didn't call it community policing. Um, but what happened during that era, and any of you guys are movie buffs, uh, buffs and you've seen movies like LA Confidential and those type of movies, um, those are based on that era where police departments really across the nation became corrupt. And a lot of the um, powers to be at the time felt that a reason for corruption was they were too in touch with the community and political influences and graft and, and those type of things caused a lot of corruption. So over the years from that time, law enforcement started shifting to what, what we call a professional model, which was kind of a hands-off, uh, more of a militaristic approach to policing. And that was really culminated in the 60s. And any of you watch you know, uh, TV land and you've seen shows like Dragnet and One Adam 12, that was kind of the pinnacle of that professional policing uh, model, just the facts. It was uh, community policing was not the focus, although they were still community relations. That was not the focus. The focus was responding to calls, uh, suppressing crime, and really there was not a focus on community policing and building relationships with community. Uh, for those of you that were born or grew up in LA or your parents did, 1965 we had ri the riots here, Watts riots. Uh, very tumultuous time throughout this nation. We had a lot of racial issues. Uh, poli politically, a lot of things were going on. Segregation in the South was being challenged. Civil rights activists were uh, taking a stance and you had a lot of tensions between the public and law enforcement across the country. Um, and here in LA, that erupted into the uh, riots from 1965, which was caused by a, a a simple traffic stop by the highway patrol that the community finally said we're fed up and this part of the city actually literally burned down so um, there was a number of things that were done to look in the rearview mirror how do we fix this and community policing was one of them we need to re-engage with the community uh, for those of you that like history you can look up all kind of reports that were done on this organization back in the 60s and recommendations on where we needed to go to move forward and repair that. Fast forward to the 70s. 
So you had kind of a hybrid, but it was really our, our model in LA was suppression based. Um, very militaristic, when I say militaristic, everything was about suppression. Um, we get to the 80s. 80s was really uh, the high point of out of control crime. You had the, the you know drug epidemic, crack cocaine was running rampant, gangs really became very prominent, particularly in this city. And that suppression model became the way of business. And we used to have operations that were, we'd go into a neighborhood and we'd zero tolerance, literally anything that, uh, or any person that committed a violation of the law, they would pretty much be either cited or, or taken to jail if it was a, a bookable offense. Um, that was what, you know, this department thought we needed to do in that day and time to curb crime. Uh, the 80s, we were very successful in arresting people. I will tell you that right now. Uh, a lot of people went to jail. Fast forward to the 90s. Um, the, the judicial system in here in California and the voters voted on three strikes. So after your third violent felony, you were locked up basically for life, 25 to life anyway. Um, marry that with our suppression strategies and what became of that was where we are now with very, very uh, overcrowded prisons in this state. Um, and it led to 1992, which was a repeat of 1965, where after the verdict of the Rodney King's trials, uh, the community was fed up and felt we, we've had enough. We've had enough of, of the way uh, law enforcement is policing our community and it erupted in riots. So to get to your question, what have we done since then? Um, 1992 was really a, a, a tipping point for LAPD, um, and it took a number of years to, to get to what I'm about to say, but uh, 92 led to a revisit, visit. we had to revisit how we did business, and we still continued to suppress throughout the early 90s. 1995, crime was still at a very high level, particularly violent crime, and um, violent crime was centered in basically minority communities, you know, in this city. Violent crime was centered in South Bureau, where we are right now, and parts of Central Bureau, where Rampart is, and, and uh, Hollywood has a share of issues, but violent crime was really on this side of Mulholland. So our suppression strategies, uh, although they were effective in arresting people and, and putting people that were committing crimes in jail, it really led to undermining the other part of our goal, which is to have a relationship with the community that we police and understand how they want to be policed how you guys want to police. I live in the city, so how we want to be policed when I'm off duty. Um, it took really up to the early 2000s for us to really, really uh, start changing the way we did business, the fundamental change. And part of that was because we got uh, mandated by the federal government through a consent decree to make some, a number of changes. So what came out of 1992 changes, uh, our department, refocus its efforts on building relationships with the community that we serve. We changed a number of training and management strategies to, to go away from um, how we had done business in the past. Our training is more vision and values focused now than it's ever been in the past. So when I came on, it was mostly about tactics, staying alive, you learn the law, you learn the policies and procedures. And we had diversity and cultural awareness training and that type of thing, but now, our training is really centered on visions and values. You know, what, what values do we want to portray to the community that we serve? Um, there, was, there was about nine points of the consent decree, a lot of management driven, where we had to change. We had to implement early warning signs when we see officers that are uh, potentially have uh, force, excessive force patterns or any type of risk management patterns. We have a system now that alerts us to take a look at that officer so we can intervene before it becomes a real problem which we didn't have during 1992 and be, uh, before that. So these type of implementations really has led to our bottom line in trying to increase the uh, amount of trust that the community has in the way we police the city. And in a lot of regards, we have, we've been successful, but we still got a lot of work to do because we're not there yet, so. Commander Scott, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, Jasmine Cranick, we want to bring you into this conversation and to, ask you to address the same question that we put to Commander Scott. In other words, to take a, a, a historical perspective, 
not necessarily back to the 1930s, but uh, to, to, to whatever starting point <laughs> you think makes the most sense, okay. to talk about progress that's been made between law enforcement and the community over the years and, and, and what still needs to be done. Okay, well, first of all, in 1992, I was 13, so, you know, we won't be going back much further than that. <laughs> Whenever you have a discussion like this, you have to put things into context. So I noticed that a lot of the words that were being used to describe 1965 and 1992 was riots. A lot of us say uprising. A lot of us say um, rebellion. So again, it's, you know, however you're coming at this conversation, you have to look at it from different points of views. I'm sure the LAPD looked at it as a riot, but the people who were out in the streets who were um, fighting, who were trying to have their voices heard, who were you know, doing what they were doing, didn't necessarily consider it a riot. And a lot of people to this day still consider even what happened in Ferguson as a rebellion, as an uprising. So I just wanna make that point. Um, you know, I produced a documentary called 41st and Central, The Untold Story of the um, Los Angeles Chapter of the Black Panther Party. And we looked at the LAPD going back to 19, up to Parker's days. Um, and so I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with um, who Chief Parker was, and, and he is the reason why we have Parker Center, or we had Parker Center. I'm the reason why we don't have Parker Center at the new building now, because he was extremely racist. He, under Chief Parker's um, reign of terror, um, African Americans and Latinos and, and pretty much every minority suffered in the city of Los Angeles. We moved forward, we had Daryl Gates. That was about the time I was growing up. Believe it or not, my mom worked under Daryl Gates. My mom worked for the Los Angeles Police Department. So, you know, mm, he wasn't the greatest either. We moved forward, I remember Bratton, um, a lot of people credit Chief Bratton with bringing sort of back community policing, um, for engaging um, more with the community, and moving forward to now we have Chief um, Charlie Beck. What the issue is, I think, um, if you want to look at it um, over like the past 40 years, a lot of it has to do with transparency. One of the biggest issues that I think the community has had, that the LAPD has tried to work on, is communication. Um, a lot of times, you know, things happen and we don't hear from the chief of police or we don't hear from the police department until days later. Or when we do hear from them, it's, I can't speak about that right now, it's a personnel matter. I can't speak about that right now, it's under investigation. That is a lot of what fuels the um, mistrust in the police, okay? Um, as a communications person, I'm always like ready to pull my locks out whenever I'm watching TV and I see Commander Smith or someone doing that dance on television because it's like the average citizen in Los Angeles is not that dense, okay? Um, and so while we have made some progress in terms of having community meetings, albeit sometimes a little too late, um, you know, we do have more frequent community meetings um, always around a hot button issue though, right? We just had one around Ezel Ford, right? And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we had that meeting maybe a week and a half after the young man was killed um, and tensions were, seemed to have been rising higher and higher and higher and I guess, you know, command staff was like, okay, let's, let's go out here and face the fire. So they had a meeting in a church. Um, that can't always be the answer. But then on the opposite side in terms of the community, you know, we have a responsibility to hold the police department accountable too. And I keep reminding, I think I, think I tweeted that last night looking at the Ferguson City Council meeting. It's like, they're like elected officials, um, you know, they can come and they can go. You know, if enough people have something to say about it. I am, I don't know, let me see what the best word to use would be. I am, okay with the progress that we've made between 1992 and today. We have made some progress. You know, folks aren't getting their doors knocked down with the battering ram every day. Um, you know, people aren't being shot by the police every single day anymore um, here in Los Angeles, but we still have a lot of work to do and it's things like, you know, what happened with Omar Abrego, Ezel Ford and, um, you know, even 
if we're gonna look at law enforcement, so the broader term looking at Marlene Pinnock and some of these other situations is what sets us back, that sends us backwards. And we got, it's almost like we gotta start over again to, re, you know, to regain that trust, to build that trust up. So I guess I would say we've made progress in terms of having community meetings uh, you know, depending on who you ask, people will say that we still need to be under a consent decree in this city um, as it relates to the LAPD. I'd probably say we do. I think the police department was more accountable when we were. Um, but other than that, we still have a lot of work to do because a lot, if you look at the news from 1992 and you look at the news today in 2014, a lot of the same, we can't talk about that, uh, it's under investigation, uh, the inspector general's looking into it, the police commission has it, it's still the same. We, we still have a lot of work to do. Well, and, uh, uh, and Jasmine, I wanna come back to you in a little bit to talk about potential solutions moving forward, additional steps that can be taken. But I think what you've heard from our two guests before we go to our student panelists is the importance of communications. And that's not unique to a relationship between law enforcement and the community. That's, uh, I, th I think you could make that same argument in any type of interpersonal relationship. The more you communicate, the less opportunity there is for misunderstanding, the less opportunity there is for anything to get out of, to get blown out of proportion. So, uh, Yasmin Sirha, I wanna come to you now. And I'm not gonna ask you to go back to the 1930s all, either, because that's probably okay, not particularly fair. I wasn't there. <laughs> but since our two guests have done a, a very good job of giving us a historical overview, let's talk, let's talk 2014. Communications are a, critical, a critically important component um, of, this, uh, uh, of conversations on this matter. One of the things I know that you spend a lot of time paying attention to is the role of social media in accelerating those communications. And that has some positive aspects, but also creates some additional challenges as well. So given what you've watched more recently, talk about how social media changes the kind of communications that our guests have been talking about. Absolutely, yeah, I think um, I probably like most people in the room, I know I followed what unfolded in Ferguson through social media, most commonly through Twitter. Um, and I think seeing, I think the point that was made about this sort of lack of communication was, was very key here, because I think social media was a place for people to sort of voice those frustrations. There was a lot of anger, there was a lot of emotion, and I think that was really where you got to see a lot of people talking about these issues, kind of, you know, for people on the ground. And not just, you know, regular people in Ferguson, but also people overseas who were tweeting at the people in Ferguson um, talking about this issue. I think social media in a lot of ways made this not just a national issue at home here, but I mean, you had people in the Middle East talking about this issue. You had people in Europe talking about this issue. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think, I mean, at least for me personally, I was being mindful to follow the journalists who were on the ground who were tweeting. And, um, for those of you who are familiar, I think one thing that really stood out was uh, the fact that I think kind of the frustration was sort of what Ms. Kanick was talking about in terms of lack of transparency and transparency communication was that a lot of our, the sources that we went to to find out information were sort of being silenced or barred. Um, I know that a, I think a total of 11 journalists were arrested throughout um, what transpired in Ferguson over the summer and into now. Um, two of them notably um, was uh, Wesley Lowry from uh, the Washington Post and um, the other name was uh, Riley, or Ryan Riley from um, the Huffington Post. Um, and for those of you, I don't know if anyone saw that, but basically they were in a McDonald's and they were, weren't moving fast enough and they were arrested. And I mean, if you could imagine, you know, being a journalist basically tweeting, I'm being arrested right now, or, um, you know, I'm, I'm being, you know, I'm being pushed out right now, and kind of seeing that on the ground kind of in your face, I think it brought this issue a lot closer to home because um, now you weren't just watching it through CNN and sort of getting that perspective. You were seeing the people who were in there who were in the middle, in the middle of it talking about what was going on. Um, I, th I think in terms of, and I know we could talk about sort of the, the pros and cons of seeing it, it through the social media lens. Um, I know on one end you kind of see directly what's happening and you definitely get that perspective that's a lot more intimate, a lot more kind of emotional from the person. On the same side, you're also kind of seeing it from that very closed in lens a little which can, at times, you have to take with a grain of salt because you don't always get the big context that um, you know, might take a couple of days to really get out a story and give you that information. Okay, um, thanks, Yasmin. Um, and for Nathaniel, uh, kind of going off of that theme of social media and uh, the major media outlets themselves, including you know, 
uh, broadcast and print uh, journalism. Uh, what role does the media play in informing public opinion on an issue, and what ca accountability, if any, uh, should it have in reporting issues which could potentially create an environment of violent protest? I think it's a three-part answer. I think the first thing to note is that the media has a duty and a right to report on things that happen like the events in Ferguson. I think the answer to the question becomes what happens when there's a breakdown in communication, not from the media to the people, but from the police departments to the media. And I think the reason why events in Ferguson get more attention than things like the shooting of Ezell Ford is because in Los Angeles, the police department calls the community organizer. And in Ferguson, the community organizer calls the police department and the police department says, we're not gonna tell you the name of the officer and we're not gonna release the details. And the communication even further breaks down when you have reporters whose duty it is to cover these events that are being rounded up and placed in cordoned areas and being arrested in McDonald's. I think that Jasmine is also right that when you have uh, a media that portrays these events uh, not as the right to assemble, but as a riot, uh, you have a fundamental breakdown. And I think that that is the only point of criticism that I think the media has that's important. But the media can't do that job alone. Um, the third answer to the question, uh, which is about transparency, is you know the media is only able to report the information that it has reported to it. There's only so much the media can do to gather statistics on how many unarmed African-American men are shot by the police. There is no national database of how many people are shot by their police. There is a supplementary homicide report that the FBI maintains that relies on voluntary contributions from police departments, and that is it. There are discharge firearm reports, um, but those are also scattered, and the ones that we do have tell a story uh, of structural violence and broader disproportionate treatment of African Americans. I think that if you want to have transparency, not only do you have a media that reports on these things, but you have a national organization that is tasked with gathering this data so that p people can have the data that they need to ask questions and to receive answers. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, and for Jasmine, once again, um, I know communication is a big part of the solution, but also could you talk about possibly some other solutions uh, between a community and its, uh, and its law enforcement that moving forward would prevent these types of um, uh, you know, violent uprisings? You know, I, I have to go back to honesty. You know, one of the, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, because um, just so you know my background, I've been in front of the camera and behind the camera. I've been on the air, on the radio, I'm a producer. So I also actually also work in the media as well. And it is very appalling and shocking every time Joel Rubin does another story in the LA Times about how the department um, mysteriously, the cameras off of the cars, we're missing, or the cameras in the building all of a sudden in the department aren't working, or you know, officers refuse to wear um, lapel cameras. These are the types of things that I think the community wants to see our police department embrace, right? If it's all about honesty, if it's all about um, transparency, then um, why does our police department in Los Angeles have such a big problem with cameras? Whether it's me holding a camera in their face or you if you're on the street and you see them doing something or it's them with the cameras in their car, the cameras in the jail, in the department, you know, so on and so forth. So when you talk about solutions, I think a big part of the solution is the department getting its act together. Really, you know, in terms of you know, the checks and balances. You know, we need these cameras, obviously, to make sure that th bad things aren't happening, okay? I have a client right now. You might have seen it on the news. Um, they had, uh, a, LAPD had a search warrant. Uh, LAPD goes into the grandparents' home. The grandparents are not home. LAPD is looking for a, a young man, the grandson. It's 7 a.m. The boy's in the back of the house sleep. They use the battering ram and knock down the door. Then they push up the cameras because, you know, nowadays everybody has like AT&T Home Life or whatever these home security 
things are, but they systematically go through the house and cover up the cameras, push the cameras up, or pull one out. And it's like, again, I'm looking at the video and I'm like, if you're doing everything right and you're just executing a search warrant, why did you need to do all of that? The department's gonna pay. No, <laughs> but you know, these are the kinds of things that I think the community wants um, and would embrace. That would be a huge step forward. Another huge step forward would be in looking at, um, again, going back to what Nathaniel said about how the media, how, how the department talks to the media, right? So like how it is right now is sometimes, even in LA, you have to ask. You literally have to call Commander Smith or you have to call over to media relations to find something out. It's not always forthcoming. It's not always a press release or a media advisory. And we need to see a little bit more rapid response and a little bit more rapid response with correct, factual, and honest answers. If you don't know, say you don't know. You know, don't push it off on the police commission. Don't push it off on the inspector general. Don't push it off on being in internal affairs and you can't talk about it. Because we're all talking about it. Everybody else is talking about it. And as I've proved before, sooner or later, that information will get leaked and it will get out there. And it's best to come, and this is from a communications viewpoint, it was best to come from the LA Police Department than coming from someone else. Ms. Cranick, thank you very much. And I wanna come back to Commander Scott. And Commander, I know you wanna talk about race relations in a broader perspective because it's, it's not appropriate to talk about that issue specifically through the context of law enforcement and, and public safety. Um, but in fairness, if there's anything that Ms. Cranick has brought up over the last minute or two that you'd like to address first, that's completely appropriate as well. Oh, sure. You know, um, on a lot of, of what Ms. Cranick said, I agree totally with. You know, we, we do need to get it right with the camera. And uh, there are many reasons that we have to get those things right. And it really boils down to trust you know, the community trusting that his police department is, is upfront and, and, and honest. So I, I totally I agree and understand that. Now, there are other situations where I have a different perspective. Uh, there are times where, uh, for a number of reasons, including tactical reasons and the safety of not only our officers, but the people that they are going in to try to protect or, or, or save in some instances, where we don't want to be on camera, you know, and where we have to do a better job is explaining when those times are, um, explaining why we did what we did. Um, and, and I'll paint you a real quick scenario. If, if, if you have an officer going into a tactical situation with a, a person that's barricaded themselves and holding somebody hostage and, and there's cameras all around the house, um, we don't want those cameras telling this person where our officer's positions are. We just don't. So yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna block out cameras and we're gonna disable cameras and all that. Uh, because if we don't, you not only is your likelihood of saving that person being held hostage gonna go down, but the likelihood of not having uh, your officers come out of their lives is gonna go down as well, or go up rather. Um, so there are situations where we, we, we have to do things that uh, might not be agreeable to a lot of people, but they make sense to do them in terms of protecting public safety. So, but I, I getting back to the fundamental issue, I agree. We do have to fix some things, and we've we've uh, we've we've made some some errors in in, uh, in our camera implementation, and we made some errors in a lot of areas that we have to fix. Quite frankly, so I, I totally agree with that. Um, on that broader perspective, though, and all these things, in my opinion, connect. Because the trust, the things that Ms. Canick are mentioning, even, you know, I, I jokingly go back to the 30s, but all these things connect because a lot of, uh, when these dots all connect, you end up with, you know, we'll call it civil unrest, uprising, or, or whatever we want to call it, because some of these issues are so deeply rooted. You know, racial issues, attentions, you can't, if, if, if you're out policing and you stop a person that's, uh, you know, 65, 70 years old, which we do quite often. And that person grew up in an era where uh, policing wasn't exactly fair to, you know, you name the race, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, you name the race. They're gonna have a perspective based on their experiences. 
and we cannot discount that. We can't wish that away. We can't say it didn't exist. We have to deal with the reality that um, that person is going to have perspective based on their experiences. So when you start connecting all these dots, there's a much broader perspective, and it gets to um, what the panel is saying um, as far as you know, databases and things like that on officer-involved shootings that really paint a picture of who's being involved in these these incidents. The public needs to know that information, and I agree with that. And they need to know so it can be scrutinized and analyzed, and we can get better. Moving forward, part of that has to start with just having the conversation, just acknowledging what happened in the past, acknowledging that it does impact where we are today and how we do business today and how people perceive how we do business and moving forward with that. You know, dialogue can go a long way. And I think part of what we do well in this city or have done well, if we, we've had those dialogues and it's not always comfortable. You sit in a room and you talk about racial tensions. I, I go back to May 4th of uh, 2013 when we had incidents on this campus and I sat in front of a packed house and got asked those questions. And it is not a comfortable conversation for many. Um, we have to have those conversations and acknowledge how we got to where we are. Because the disparity in, in whether it be officer involved shootings, incarceration rates, you know, a lot of that conversation um, adds to the frustration of things that lead to civil unrest. So we don't have the conversation and explain it and try to do something about changing it. If it's systemic, if it's, uh, I don't know if you guys have you know, the term implicit bias, that something just by the way we have done business uh, implicitly might be biased. For instance, if, if you're in a community that is riddled with violence, from a police manager standpoint, you're going to flood that area of resources just to triage the violence, to stop the violence. You want visibility out there. Well, what does that cause? causes more enforcement in that community for the most part. Um, in that community, if that community is you know, dominated by you know, whether it be African Americans or Hispanic, then that enforcement rate is going to be higher than it is in a, in a community that is, has no crime. Because we're going to be trying to put a, a Band-Aid on that, on, that, on that position. So it really, when you think about all the pieces that go into place, it's a very complicated issue, but part of it is being held accountable, having these conversations, and being able to explain what we do. And if it's not justified, we got to suffer the consequences and fix it. Well, we've, uh, we've gone a, a little bit longer with the panel discussion before getting to audience questions than we normally do. And I, I don't know about all of you, but I think it was a well worthwhile in order to have such a deep and broad discussion with our panel. That said, you know when I've been monopolizing this uh, conversation long enough, and we wanted to open it up there's time for at least a couple of a question, uh, questions from all of you. And just two quick reminders before we go to questions. So we're gonna ask two things of you if you have a question to ask. Number one, if we call on you, tell us who you are. Uh, tell us your name so we know who's, who's joining the conversation. And number two, as I said earlier, particularly on a topic that can be as sensitive as this one, remember that particularly if you're gonna pose a question to someone with whom you disagree, that person's not your opponent, that person's not your enemy, it's just somebody who has a different perspective. And we'd ask that you frame your question to that person with the same respect and regard that they'd hope that, uh, that we, you'd hope that they would show you also. So who has, uh, who has questions for any of our panelists? Yes. Jesse has a series of great questions in there, and if I can take the, the if I can take your central premise and narrow it just a little bit, 
your question, which I think uh, is a really, really good one, is not just a government, but a law enforcement operation in particular, can it be more effective working in particular communities if the force itself is more diverse in its makeup? Andrew Scott, maybe that's something you can discuss. Sure, uh, I th I, absolutely, I think it can be. It's, um, it is a challenge, and it, there was a, a, I think it was a New York Times article a couple of weeks ago that, that looked at law enforcement agencies all over the country, and I'm gonna shorten this answer, but um, you first start with the elected officials. You, some of these cities that were, were looked at by, by this, this article, or the writer of this article, um, you have, you know, mayors that are, are, are you know, uh, black, Hispanic, female. Um, so you have diversity in some levels of, of the government there, but in a lot of the cities, the actual police department that polices the city, it was, it was a disparate amount of male white officers. Even though the government, even though maybe the administration, some of these cities, like you know, Ferguson is, is a minority community, uh, just to use that, because that was one of the departments cited in this article. But their, the ratio of, of white officers was way higher than the, 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 the uh, demographics of the city. So it has to be at all levels is the answer to that question. And, and, but a lot of it starts with going back to trust. You know, there's, there's certain communities don't want to have anything to do with a law enforcement career because of their experiences with law enforcement. And that's the part that we got to continually work on where people growing up in a community that, you know, South LA or, or communities like that, um, realize that it's, 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 it's not a bad thing if you want to be a police officer. And in some communities, that's not the case. Ms. Ms. Kranick, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on this also. How important is it for both a police department or more broadly a government to reflect the, the makeup of the community it serves? Okay, so I was thinking about how I would answer this because sometimes I have to be the bearer of bad news. First, if, you're gonna, if we're going to look at the police department, yes, part of the issue is um, more, um, more of us, more African Americans, Latinos, and other minorities need to... Um, apply and, and want to be a part of the LAPD, okay? But at the same time, they need to be accepted. And that goes back to a policy issue, an issue that has been going on in the department for a really long time as it relates to how blacks promote, how Latinos promote, you know, who gets accepted even, ex you know, you know, and you know, as African Americans, sometimes our credit might not be as great. So we might get disqualified on that, even though we make every other um, we meet every other requirement. So when you, when, when you talk about the need to recruit from the community, I agree, but there's still some issues in the department that make that even hard, and, which is part of the reason why every year we pay out millions and millions of dollars in discrimination cases against the city of LA, particularly with the fire department and the police department. Now, going back to um, and this is my favorite, favorite topic ever, is like voter engagement. Look, I looked at that Ferguson City Council meeting last night and I was tweeting about it because I was really frustrated because people are yelling at the council and they're yelling at the mayor. And I could tell that that was the first time many of those people had ever been to a city council meeting. And I always say here in LA, like I could stand on the corner of King and Crenshaw and offer $20 to somebody to tell me, who's your, where, what's your address? Okay, tell me your, um, tell me a U.S. Senator that represents you, tell me a Congress member, an Assembly member, a State Senator, Council member, uh, someone on the Board of Supervisors that, re that um, represents you. Most people would look at me like I'm stupid. They have no idea. So part of it falls back on us. See, we get mad when things happen, and then we want to go and yell and scream at the mayor. We want to go yell and scream at the City Council, and then we're like, well, how did they get in there in the first place? Because you didn't show up and vote. That's how they got in there, and your people did. I work on making sure people show up to vote for the right candidate. And so, you know, when we don't, when we, when we decide that, you know, the, it doesn't work, my vote doesn't matter, my vote doesn't count. Look, it's the only process that we have right now in this in 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 this country. This is the democratic process. This is what you have to do. You have to show up to the polls and you have to vote for whoever you want to see in office. And it's a shame 
that while a lot of people couldn't tell you who, you know, I actually had someone tell me, that, and, I'm, and the way I'm going to say this is the way they said it to me, that Antonio Villaraigosa was still the mayor of the city of Los Angeles in 2014. That is sad. But they knew that the president was Barack Obama and that his wife was Michelle. We don't do enough in our communities to educate our own selves. Like, you know, sometimes we get a mailer and Maxine is telling us, ooh, you vote for this person, but because I said so, vote for this person, this person, that person. And if we do go to vote, we'll just do what Maxine said to do because she looks like us and we like her. We don't take enough time to study the issues, study the candidates from judges. Do you have any idea how we vote for judges? These judges that are you know, handing down these harsh sentences, sending our brothers and sisters away. Ms. Ms. Kranich, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, um, because this this is probably the most critical part of the entire conversation. Oh, I'm fine, I'm done. And unfortunately, <laughs> no, it, it is the most important part of the conversation, and unfortunately it's coming right as we run up, at the, up, uh, up against the end of our hour. So I just, uh, before we thank our panelists and before we make a few announcements, I just wanna, I just wanna reiterate her last point. Um, when, the, when the violence uh, began in Ferguson, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton uh, was, was there. And sometimes I agree with the Reverend Sharpton, sometimes I don't. Uh, but on that particular day, I was in absolute agreement with him. He said, the answer is not violence, the answer is voting. And I think it's a critically important conversation. As many of you guys know, I spend a lot of time saying that politics is too important to be left to the politicians. We spend a lot of time talking about the importance of increased civics education in elementary and in, uh, and in high school. And so regardless of the topic, whether it's today's or any other that we discuss, the future students talk back, knowing that an educated populace and an engaged populace is the most important component to solving any of the challenges we face as a city, a state, or, or a country. Um, I know there are other questions, and I need to apologize to those of you who didn't have a chance to weigh in. Um, but I have a couple of announcements to make before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, uh, as many of you know, the Unruh Institute of Politics offers a political internship program class every semester. And the deadline for signing up for Poli Sci 395 this year is this Friday. And if you're interested in er interning in the office of an elected official, on a campaign, on behalf of an issue or cause that's important to you, come to our offices in VKC 263 and ask for Jody Epstein. Jody, wave to the crowd. That's Jody, and she will help you find an internship. You can get two or four academic credits for interning, and you can become even that much more involved a member of your community. Um, we'll be back in this room two weeks from today for our next Students Talk Back Lunch. We'll be talking um, about the challenges in the Middle East, particularly as presented by ISIS in Syria and Iraq. But in between now and then, this semester, every Wednesday that we don't have a Students Talk Back Lunch, we'll be doing a Wednesday evening event a legislative roundtable discussion with our two legislative fellows, former Assemblymember Anthony Portatino and State Senator Mark Weiland. And they'll both be joining us next Wednesday night in the Mud Hall of Philosophy, Room 102. We get a chance to meet two former elected officials, hear their perspective on these issues, and get to know them a little bit. And then finally, third announcement. Uh, the Unruh Institute will be joining with our colleagues across USC and across Los Angeles on Tuesday, September 23rd. Uh, to celebrate National Voter Registration Day. And we'll be gathering in front of Tommy Trojan at 12 o'clock noon. And we'll also have registration booths uh, set up on Truesdale throughout the day. So if you haven't registered to vote, or if you have registered to vote and you know somebody who hasn't, drag them there. Threaten them violently. I'm kidding about the violently part, but threaten them. Tell them what happens if they don't register to vote and if they decide not to vote. So one, internships, come see Jody in VKC 263. Second, our legislative roundtable a week from tonight in Mud Hall, Room 102. And third, Tuesday, September 23rd, National Voter Registration Day, 12 o'clock noon in front of Tommy Trojan. Uh, before I let you leave, I'm going to ask one favor of you. Please join me in thanking our panelists, Yasmin Sirhan, Nathaniel Haas, Jasmine Kanick, and Commander William Scott. Thank you so much for leading us in this conversation today. Thanks to my co-moderator, DT Editor-in-Chief, Yuno Lee. Yuno, thank you so much for being here. 
thanks to our entire team at the Unruh Institute for putting on these programs uh, every week. Uh, Tanya Mercado, Jody Epstein, uh, Kirsten Olson, and in particular, Laura Hill for the hard work they do to make these events come off as well as they do. Guys, thank you very, very much. And finally, thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, it means a lot to us that you join us for these conversations, and if we're going to move forward on these policy challenges, it's going to be because people like you decide to continue to participate in these conversations. So thank you so much for being here. Give yourselves a round of applause. We'll see you next Wednesday night, and then we'll see you back here in two weeks. Thanks so much.